So I'm going to get started. Uh, thank you for taking out the time to uh, learn more about this work I'm doing. So uh, LiveDex is an online portal and uh, we curate uh, experiences uh, for credentials. And I'll talk about my background uh, in, a, in a later slide. So what is LiveDex? Uh, an online portal for youth to create a longitudinal portfolio of soft skills uh, that leads to college and career readiness. Uh, so I have an outline for the presentation because the time is very limited. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the power of curating experiences. And this theme is going to run through the presentation from time to time. Then I'm going to talk about the need or the market as they talk about. And then talk about a little bit about the portal and how we do it, the micro-credentials part, the machine learning part, and the college credit, and then a call to action. So the power of creating experiences. Um, we all have personal experiences that are embedded in micro stories. And what LibDex does is we highlight the hidden skills embedded in these personal experiences. And we use this particular phenomena to re redefine achievement. So I'm gonna link this whole idea with my personal background and introduce myself formally. So I'm a professor of STEM education at CU Denver. Uh, you can look at my academic accomplishments. You can look at my academic awards and which is great. It tells you what all I've accomplished, but it doesn't tell you who I am, what kind of skill sets I've had in the past uh, to actually arrive at this point. So I migrated to the US about 20 plus years ago from India, right? I migrated by myself as a doctoral student uh, that came to do PhD. I was, a, uh, I was a teacher in a school in India. And, and can you imagine the skill set that I had at that point to not only apply to US universities to actually get funding to actually come here on a student visa, which is very difficult if you're a single woman in your 20s, they won't give it to you. And, and then come here and uh, assimilate yourself in a totally different culture, education system, and then be here where I'm a full professor of STEM education at CU Denver. So the point I'm trying to make is that we all have stories that are uh, part of our, our life, you know, our lived experiences. And hidden in those stories are some skills that, that uh, we don't highlight for many people. Uh, and so that's what LiveDex is trying to do. So um, I'm going to talk about the need. So this idea about lived experiences and curating lived experiences to identify hidden skills is great. But is there really a need for this work is what I'm trying to get at. So the need is, I'm gonna give you two examples. So in Colorado, for example, starting 2021, there is gonna be a new graduation requirement and you can look at that essential skills needed for workforce of educational opportunities beyond high school. And I'm not gonna go into all of this, but you can see that there are special skill sets that uh, schools are requiring students to not only acquire, but demonstrate and then use that as part of the graduation requirement. Then you have University of North Texas, and uh, this is uh, what they call marketable skills. So soft skills, power skills, marketable skills, essential life skills, social emotional learning skills, it goes by different language. But you can see that University of North Texas is requiring students to demonstrate their skills before they graduate college. These are two of the many examples that I wanted to share to establish a need for the LibDex work. So I'm not going to go into a little bit details about uh, how LiveDex does what it does and then kind of give a sense and also give you an example. So um, what we are doing in LiveDex is I'm arguing that we, we are redefining professional achievement. Uh, uh, we call ourselves courageous curators of lived experiences because it is a challenging work, but it's very important work. Um, and then uh, we, we use research and psychology framework to make sense of students' experiences. And we are awarding up to 172 soft skills in 30 plus categories. And then eventually the goal is, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, is to start using machine learning algorithm to be able to code data automatically 
and so that uh, the data is uh, real time for students, but also use the machine learning algorithm to create an ecosystem where we can connect students with content, peer mentors, adult mentors, so that the help they need, it becomes a part of this ecosystem. So what we are helping them to create is an online portfolio of soft skills. So I wanted to show us our journey so far. Um, so this work started literally last spring and summer. I'm a university professor, so I'm very much associated with the CU Innovations Office. So in the last summer, uh, we did, I built the MVP. And uh, in the spring, I completed the iCorps program, which is a customer discovery program. Uh, I reached out to schools and agreed to schools and initiate pilot studies and did customer discovery to establish the need for this work. In the fall, fall semester, based on the data that we got from 200 plus students, I revised the MVP, uh, recruited and trained coders so that those were the people who were training the uh, coding the data. And I collected and monitored data for machine learning. And then I continued the customer discovery process by talking to other schools and uh, university. So uh, I want to come back to the first part, which is power of curating experience and give you a kind of a concrete example of how it looks like. So let's take an example of Alexis and this is her profile. She's a junior in high school. She's a varsity athlete and so on and so forth. But then schools will talk about this dropout risk, which is a very deficit perspective. So she has this dropout risk. She is low socioeconomic status. She supports her family by taking care of her siblings. She's a first generation student. Um, and what LiveDex does is we take the student's risk and we convert them to credentials and we redefine achievements. So this is how Alexis' profile looks on LibTex. And this is all up for revision, but you can see that she's received various micro-credentials or power skills. Uh, for example, things creatively, problem recognition, pulling your weight, which is very much in alignment with the need slides that I shared with you. So um, uh, there's this other piece that I briefly want to talk about is that LiveDex allows students to kind of stack their power skills into LiveDex micro-credentials. And then I've, I'm developing this college course that uh, is going to be approved by the curriculum committee at the School of Education and Human Development. And they can bring this stacked up uh, power skills and the LiveDex micro-credentials and stack them to actually get college credit for soft skills, which they can bring into their college uh, undergraduate as a uh, elective rather than in the main uh, uh, core studies. And that is something I get a lot of questions about. So uh, moving forward where I am right now. So uh, this spring and summer, we have collected and monitored data for machine learning. Uh, we are cr creating a machine learning algorithm. Um, and then I'm uh, recruiting additional sites. I have integrated the legal documents, which is terms of service and user agreement. We're in the process of doing some branding, gamification of the portal. I've applied for funding, and I've also presented this work at a, a badging conference. In fall 2022, we are scaling this up with 4,000 plus students. Uh, we're going to deploy the machine learning algorithm and continue to revoice it. So uh, we're hoping that we would get a uh, high prediction uh, accuracy because the data that we're giving is very um, clean to the machine learning expert. I'm also going to apply for a provisional patent to protect the intellectual property. Of course, raising fund is another one, marketing social media presence, and then prepare for paid customers because Two of the school districts I'm working, the, when I presented this work pre-COVID-19, uh, it was very clear to them that pilot is going to be free, but then after that, they'll be paying for it. So the challenges are uh, investment risk aversion in education technologies. Schools and universities have longer sales budget cycles, and COVID-19 induced uncertainties in K-12 and higher education. Um, my call to action is I invite everybody to partner with LiveDex to empower youth and accelerate opportunities. And then I wanna give a big thank you to all of you. And I wanna leave the slide so that you can see uh, some of the summary items. And at this point, I think I have about 20 seconds before I hit the 10 minute mark. So I'm gonna stop here. You can reach me at that email and I'm gonna uh, take any questions that you might have. So thank you again for the opportunity, much appreciated. Thank you, Gita. That was great.
and, uh, and we're not that we're not that um, wretched, but we wouldn't shut you off at twenty. We don't want to count anybody off mid sentence. <laughs> it's never happened with a group. <laughs> but thank you for being so um, aware of the time. I appreciate that very much. So, who has questions for Gita? I have a, a comment and a question. Yeah. I think this is awesome because um, I'll tell you why. Is I grew up in California and worked for 19 years in DC, Maryland, Virginia region, mostly Virginia. And all of the little subtle things that I had learned that probably were soft skills just from going to school in California were not present in a lot of the folks I worked with in Virginia. And what happened is I assumed that they all had these same skills. And then I got really frustrated because they actually had not absorbed those in school and college. And it's just interesting because if you have a way to measure this stuff, there'd be a way for somebody to know. It sounds like your product is all, of, all about training, but also measuring, right? Yes, it's and, primarily about measuring and then uh, training. Okay, okay. So you can't fix it unless you measure it. So this is, this is really great. Um, really awesome. I can see it right away. And the, the other thing is, uh, who sees this presentation normally, the, the, this type of PowerPoint? So I customized this for your group because Tara explicitly told me that it can't be a pitch deck or like an yep. investor presentation. So I kind of made it a mix of, you know, a journey slash uh, progress slash what's the big idea behind this, uh, this particular <laughs> project. Yeah. And your potential customers might be schools? Schools, uh, schools, colleges, and actually companies also. So mm. this one I especially kind of focused because there are two different market segments. So I'm actually in a conversation with this company um, uh, where they train computer programmers from unlikely of places. So they actually recruit minority computer programmers and they train them. They have an onboarding process. And then if a person you know, uh, qualifies, then they bring you on board. They train you for six months and then they place you in different companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they are trying to do in-house is create a resume of soft skills that go, goes along with technical skills. And so when I presented to them, this is exactly what they needed. So I have sent them a contract and they are sharing it with the product team and they're very interested. We've had two conversations with them. Um, and so we'll see, COVID-19 has uh, influenced everything and everybody. Uh, but I'm very optimistic that we'll, we'll do a pilot with them, a paid pilot with them. And last comment, it might just be another idea that a lot of folks are taking a gap year uh, next fall, which is going to yes. hurt a lot of universities. Yes. But high school students are just saying, you know, and their parents, right? Why am I going to go to college? I'm not going to be there. Uh, this stuff could actually be very relevant to a gap year because it's not Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. and that's what one of the schools have sent, said that, that they would have their students, I mean, they'll be technically registered, but they won't be attending classes, but then the schools are supposed to kind of oversee what they're doing. So they're going to have these students come to LiveDex and document all the voluntary experiences and all of those things and kind of get a soft skills resume based on the experiences. So as of now, what we document in, re in resumes are events and activities. And then it's up to the employer or the admission guidance counselor to kind of tease out the skill set that are embedded in those activities. What LiveDex does, it solves that problem, is saying, you give us your experiences and we are going to tease out these skill sets and soft skills, what people use, because that's what is most common. But um, it's happening even for elementary age students. So there's a school district in Kentucky that is giving quote unquote essential life skill virtual backpack for first graders. It's of course done by their teachers, but they're beginning to see that this needs to happen early on. So uh, there's an opportunity to partner with them as well. Yeah, can you give us an example of when you say soft skills, what specifically and how does that work? So I come to you as a student, let's say I'm a student. Yes. And what is it that I will give to you and what is it that I will that you will collect from me? Or yes. So uh, hold on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share a, uh, another slide with you. I didn't include that in here. And I'm going to bring up that PowerPoint and uh, share an example actually with you because that will help you in terms of uh, what is it that students are giving and what is it that we're making sense of. So let me go ahead 
and share my slide. So this is an actual example that a student uh, submitted. Hold on. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the PowerPoint, but you can see this is an actual student example. So we give them prompts to give us these data. Um, so this student talked about helping somebody. And this is the example they gave us about helping a person in DMV uh, where they were trying to ask for a bathroom in ASL. And uh, so then we take this experience and then uh, we code it using what you call the lived X framework. So the lived X framework is the one that I'm talking about, which is copyrighted, which is, uh, comes from research frameworks and everything. And we give them these power skills. So this is, uh, uh, this is happening in, again, in the lived experiences, right? But we get experiences that are happening in the math classroom or they're happening in their STEM classroom or they're happening on a field trip or they're happening, the student gave this example of talking with a Buddhist monk about materialism and um, getting uh, kind of having a direction in life that is not focused on material accumulation. It was a high school student and you read that submission and it's so profound. And so we, we were able to give them micro-credentials in different categories. So right now you have 172 micro-credentials that are based, housed in 32 categories. So civic awareness is one of them. Perspective taking is another one. Uh, written communication is another one. Oral communication is another, and so on and so forth, right? And so what happens is that they get this power skills. Uh, not only in that communication piece, but it also goes to their social emotional learning. So there is a big body of literature on social emotional learning, which we're finding out a lot of high school students are so stressed out. And we know about you know, the suicide rate going up and all those. So we are taking their experiences in content or expertise in a particular area and linking that to social emotional learning. So this is an example of that particular uh, like the way we do it. And the other slide I didn't share was a research slide. So uh, how, do you, how do you defend the methodology? Uh, so the methodology that we are using here is basically what you call inter-rater reliability. So the same data gets coded by four people. And then we, we train these coders actually, and we create what you call shared meaning making. Because again, that's why I call ourselves courageous curators of lived experiences, because we're actually making sense of somebody's lived experiences. We need to be very comfortable and confident that that has a shared meaning. So then you look at the coded data and then you run a bunch of stats and then you kind of say, yes, we have high agreement amongst four people and we're actually getting ready to publish that data. So that methodology will be defended. And same goes with machine learning. So the machine learning, I don't know, I'm sure you've read these books, but if you haven't, I'm gonna share this. It's called the uh, uh, algorithms of oppression, automating inequality. So just because it's algorithm, it's not good because we, we are learning about systemic racism. All the biases and all the uh, uh, all the the ways we think about the world and the society, uh, if you start to use existing data, all those biases show up. So when you do Google search, all those because Google is using existing data, uh, and so those biases show up. Whether it's about uh, black people, it's about uh, uh, it shows up in banking a lot where. Uh, black and brown people get, have to pay high interest rates because the banks are using algorithms to kind of quote unquote verify your status as a borrower. So there's a lot of you know issues. Uh, we are collecting our own data for machine learning. The data is asset based. It is submitted by student when they're saying that this is how well I'm doing. And then the machine learning is going to be kind of building that uh, kind of, uh, I guess the DNA into that machine learning algorithm. So yeah, let me give you a little feedback from my perspective as a former banker, um, because it's, it's kind of a, it's a big passion of mine. Um, and speaking of the algorithms and how people are selected for, for lending opportunities and uh, or borrowing opportunities. And as a former banker, every loan application that I took, it was declined. 
I immediately was on the phone and fighting for it because that was how my income was based. So I don't care whether you're purple or an alien from Mars. I want you to get the loan because that is what my incentive is driven on. And that's also who I am as a human being. So, but only if it makes sense. You don't want to make loans that don't make sense. What my opinion is on, um, and again, this is just my opinion alone, is that the problem with is far less simple than an obvious bias up front at that point. The problem is more complex. It's about opportunity. It's about education. It's about, um, it's about reaching out to certain demographics and certain neighborhoods and certain communities and, and making um, lending accessible, making it understood that I know it doesn't look pretty. I know it doesn't look like we're talking about the lovely city council newsletter. I know that's not exciting to look at for a lot of people, but these are the things that take you to the thing that is more exciting at a, at a, at a later level. Those are, at least speaking of soft skills, those are much more hard to address. And it's easy for us to point a figure and go, you bad guys, you bad guys. And it's, it's way more complicated than that. We really have a lot of work to do. The systemic racism is much more inbred in our system accidentally, unintended. Um, and that makes it more difficult to address, in my opinion. Hey, Gita, I just had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, like Steve was saying earlier, uh, there's gonna be a high demand because uh, you know what's going on right now. Uh, Children can get in the, their schools. Uh, we had a short school year. Uh, so I just wanted to see what, what was your age demographic for, um, for the students? Is, are you just strictly like high school, juniors, seniors going transitioning into college or then does it stop at the college age? Uh, what, what age are, are you trying to reach? So uh, according to the law, you can have a portal like this and the students have, the youth have to be 13 plus. It's the same as Facebook. So 13 plus is what we're going for. Right now I'm working with uh, high school students only, but uh, eventually the goal is to uh, work with college students as well. Okay, and then um, is uh, LiveX, are you, an, an is it set up as a nonprofit? Is it a for-profit? It is a for-profit. It's a startup and it's a startup coming out of the university and uh, a university owns the license and I have an exclusive license deal. I'm working on finalizing the exclusive license deal with the university because I'm a university professor. Anything I create is owned by the university. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did not know that. Because I, I was wondering that because in the presentation, it talked a lot about uh, fun fundraising. Um, and eventually, you're going to move past that fundraising. I understand it's just for the initial setup. Would you be? How how would your revenue? How how would you achieve your revenue? Is it? I mean, selling the data. Is it um, charging the schools, the individual um, students? Uh, how do you see uh, Libdex doing that? So there are three ways of thinking about revenue. Um, it's going to be B2B. So I'm going to be selling it to schools and sending uh, site licenses, basically. Because if the schools feel the need to adopt this as a product, because it's part of the graduation requirement, and they don't have a tool, then they'll be willing to do that, right? Uh, the second way is to partner with content providers and promoting those that content because we have it's going to be driven by artificial intelligence so we can really do very good matchmaking hopefully and then uh, creating money that way the sec third thing would be to after i have a patent i can license it to other people who may want to use the algorithm uh, and integrate in their product or integrate livdex into the product so the livdex product gets integrated into let's say pearson wants to offer a soft skill tool they can come to us and they can pay us a fee, and then we will offer LibDex, uh, soft LibDex through them, and they can do it, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of have the licensing. So those are the three ways I've thought about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On a topical thing, I love the name of your company. It makes perfect sense called Live That to be LibDex. 
based on the fact that it's related to lived experiences. So how did you, how did you, can you talk, tell us about the naming process? Because that's always a fun story for me. Yes, yeah, so uh, we started, I started with lived experiences, lived EXP. I mean, I have gone and bought all those domains. I'm like paying for all those without actually using them because I, I wasn't sure. The reason I hesitated with X because X rated movies. And when you're working with schools and if you put X, it'll block, like the schools will block the website. And I kind of knew that, but then after talking to a few people and everything, I think it became kind of the feedback I got was like, when you say live decks, it becomes a conversation starter. So I think that's, that's a good name for a company because then you can explain the lived stands for lift, you know, life and then X stands for experiences. And then, so that's how I came up with it. It makes me think of a meme that I, as a parent I've seen uh, on a regular basis. And it's something along the lines of, and negotiating with a four-year-old who's screaming their head off and that that should be able to be put on a resume. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, Gita. Thank you. Um, Helen here with bad internet in the rural area. Um, would you talk a little bit about how you may see LiveDex um, in the maybe first generation college student space? You're working with youth, maybe junior high, high school, but it seems really important then if these students continue on to university with this university credit, how would LiveDex maybe support that um, time in a youth life as they enter into university space? Yes, so I see multiple ways, but I'll talk about two primarily. So one of the things with higher education, as you know, is happening is with COVID-19 and even before, our enrollments have been going down across the nation in different programs. And so, um, I think colleges are gonna be more open to students bringing credit from high school. And they already do that through dual enrollment programs. Students take AP courses and other courses. I'm hoping that we could do uh, like a, a, a dual enrollment thing with LiveDex, the, the, the undergraduate course that I've developed. So students will do the work on LiveDex and then get college credit that they'll be allowed to bring. So if we can reduce the number of college credit that students have to pay for, I think we can make it much cheaper for them. So that's just a straightforward. And in my conversation with high schools, I have told them, share with them that students can get up to nine credit hours through LevTex in the soft skill arena. And if colleges will accept, they can bring that. So that reduces your tuition by nine credit hours. The other way I think about is that first generation students don't have the specific profile that other students might have. And the example I shared, the Alexis example, she has other things that uh, your traditional, you know, mainstream students will not have. Um, but then allowing those skill sets to be captured as formal credentials and be recognized, I think that is something, a leg up, we can give to first generation students. In the body of literature, we call it funds of knowledge. So funds of knowledge is a body of literature where we say we want to have asset-based perspective about students. So if a student is bilingual, right now we have a deficit perspective saying you're an English language learner, right? ELL. But we don't think about a student, uh, a bilingual student saying, you can speak two languages, you can navigate two workspaces, right? So it's like flipping that kind of uh, lens about deficit to asset-based perspective, right? In the literature now, we are beginning to call them emerging bilinguals rather than ELL. So we're changing the language because we know language is important. So uh, I think that's what LibDex can do. LibDex can amplify those hidden skills these first generation students bring to the table that formal credentials do not recognize or value. And I think those are the two ways I can think about LibDex kind of uh, changing the status quo a little bit. Thank you, very insightful, thank you. One other quickie, um, I'm, my team did something that translates directly into a pleasantness of voice analysis. And that's something from a long time ago, but we have a, a way to sort of do that in a Mechanical Turk way, if you know Mechanical Turk. I do. Um, the, what I was going to say is I mentioned this to somebody 
who immediately said, damn, we need that in the IT companies. The IT companies would love that soft skill, plus also accent analysis um, for um, understandability. And sometimes even professors are hired that have such thick accents that you can't, uh, not you, but have <laughs> are harder to understand you know, for the students. And there's no way to measure that. And so it was just interesting that, that um, soft skills came up as immediate name for what I was talking about. I'd never heard of soft skills, but um, the HR, they were saying HR of big companies, especially programmers and all that could really love this, what you're doing. Yes, exactly. So that's the other market segment that uh, if I'm able to do a pilot, paid pilot with this company, I think I would have something concrete to take to other companies. Mm -hmm. And I think then we can move from there. Yeah. And just so you know, the, the, the frame of reference that this came up in was with Indian IT companies that have overseas clients, big yes. potential market. Yeah. Yes, I can totally understand and I relate to that. I can imagine some challenges, and then we're coming up on the hours, so I'm going to keep it quick, but I can imagine some of the challenges of your business is the relativity of it, like um, Steve mentioned, pleasantness of voice. Well, I, we, can all, we all know that that's different. That's why we have multiple voice options on our GPS system, is you know, the voice that I find grating, somebody else finds pleasant. Um, those, are, those are probably some big challenges for your organization, right? Well, I, I think about pleasantness of voice is kind of and I, I don't, I'm not challenging you, Steve, but it's kind of like a profiling. So pleasantness based on whose preference, right? So a pleasant voice share might be construed as something else in another culture. So if, if we are thinking about a workforce here, uh, and if, if people can think about a framework which, around which you can say, okay, this is a pleasant voice, then um, I, I can understand where that is coming. The accent part, I get it totally because I, I get that from students a lot, especially if they're taking computer science courses and they have faculty from other places. I get that a lot. And, and one other piece of data, I don't want to take up time, but the pleasantness of voice stuff, exactly, I understand what you're saying. That relates to the customer loss of gigantic call centers of things like cable companies. So you could have a, a person that, it's just not enthusiastically helpful to the customers and they have uh, the cost per lost customer versus the cost per new customer or the acquisition cost per new customer, huge. So there's this billions of dollars that can be saved if you get people to measure and improve their interactions, their soft skills over the phone. Wow, things that I don't know, Steve. Yeah. And I actually was looking at how to do that with Mechanical Turk, followed by learning rules that could be applied to the Amazon um, machine learning algorithms. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, Mechanical Turks is a good way to go. I mean, it's a very cheap way to go to, yeah. I tried Mechanical Turks for this work, but it didn't work. We couldn't get people to agree. Sorry, we are at 10.01, so I'm already a little bit late, and I'm sorry about that, guys. But I um, wanted to give you one last question and so um, very quickly briefly is there something specific is there anything specific that our woman in Santa Barbara woman in Cup Santa Barbara community can do for live that uh, I always invite feedback and so if you go back and you think of things then uh, I would love to hear from you and then the second thing is, because this is such a new space for me, the entrepreneurial space, the other thing I invite is networking, both with fellow entrepreneurs, funders, any other person, right, that can help me move forward. So those are the two things that would be very, very helpful. Good deal. We'll look out for your, um, for that survey that you want to send us to, and we'll be happy to fill that out. And All righty. So next week... Oh, there we go. Oh, she gave my name. I forgot my three slides. Okay, we, 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 okay, yes. No, I didn't forget it. All right, so one reminder. What can, we've already done that question. I add new, I add new slides and it throws me off. Next week at One um, Million Cup Santa Barbara, we have Armin Arustamov, who's presenting God at Life, Inc. 
um, and Got It Life Inc. provides a mental guide for athletes with questions and um, question and answer algorithms to stimulate an internal dialogue. So, you know, we are our toughest critic is kind of the way I, I'm understanding this. And but to make that dialogue with yourself specifically, especially when you reach certain levels um, of your field, I suppose. And if you please would invite a friend or business, and Gita, I invite you and Helen to come back and join us again next week and in future weeks. We'd love to have you. The more people that we have um, who are interested in this program, the better it is for the people like yourself who are presenting. So um, please come back and, and as an attendee and listen to some other, some other presenters and give them your feedback as a professional and as an entrepreneur. And if you have suggestions, events, information, et cetera, that you want to uh, want us to know about, please send that to us at Santa Barbara at OneMillionCups.com. I hope you all have a terrific week. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Have a great Fourth of July weekend. Yes. Thanks.